Hello, I'm Pavel Schlossberg, Assistant Professor in the Communication and Leadership Department in the School of Professional Studies. My 12 and a half minute lecture, Globalization and the Practice of Folk Catholicism in Michoacan, Mexico, is in recognition of Gonzaga University's 125th anniversary. I want to thank you for coming and I want to thank Angela Ruff and all the organizers of the event for inviting me to make this presentation. And as importantly, I also want to thank the individuals in the communities in Mexico where I did my field work and which shared their joys and sometimes their struggles and gave me permission to discuss some of these experiences. Uh, so uh, very briefly, I want to uh, locate this uh, area of Mexico where I did my work uh, and kind of locate this a little bit. Um, and uh, it, the state itself is, is marked in, in green, and I was uh, literally, I did my field work right in the center of, of that uh, state. Um, and my perspective on how media culture and globalization has impacted ritual, cultural, and rural Mexico is shaped by two years of ethnographic field work in rural Michoacan. I was a guest and friend in the communities of Tocuro, Aracuti, and Santa Ana, Uricho precisely in, the, in, in central Michoacan in that state. And these are communities that have anywhere between 500 and 1,000 people uh, uh, living in each town or each pueblo village. Um, and, and the ritual culture, which I will be talking about, in which I documented and in which I also participated, uh, are known as pastorelas, uh, the shepherd's tale in English is, is the translation. And these dra dramatic, didactic, moral dramas are staged during the winter holidays in that central Michoacan or the Lake Pátzcuaro region which I'll be discussing. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the pastorelas before I talk about glo uh, cultural globalization and its impacts and all of that. Um, so the pastorelas, the story of the shepherd's tale, depicts a journey of the shepherds to the manger in Bethlehem to honor and be blessed by the baby Jesus. Uh, the drama is also the allegory of every man, the struggle with sin and temptation on the road to salvation. Uh, the pastorelas are masquerades, and so the performers put on masks uh, many locally carved to represent and take on the personalities of various characters in the dramas. Um, and they will also wear appropriate outfits, in many uh, cases also produced or sewn at home. Uh, the image you have in front of you right now are precisely two individuals playing the role of the shepherds and they're uh, in the ceremonial moment, they're at the manger and uh, they're there to both honor and receive blessings from the baby Jesus. Um, uh, the next image is an uh, image of the Archangel Michael. Um, and uh, often is, uh, and he's the protector sent by God uh, to, to protect the shepherds in their journey. Obviously, there's the, the, the very literal and metaphoric, allegorical meaning, symbolic meaning of, of, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, character. And uh, he, will, he protects the shepherds symbolically on, on, their, on their journey. Uh, the next image is one of the characters uh, very much uh, from contemporary media culture uh, who was known as a super, basically uh, a version or rendition of Superman who also frolicked and, and made their stage and uh, entered the scene. Um, and so you have these very customary traditional characters and roles and then you also have all these characters from contemporary culture uh, incorporated into the drama. So uh, again, as I mentioned, my work looked at the impact of media culture and globalization on ritual culture. Uh, the drama incorporates these figures from pop culture, political figures, figures from entertainment right into the drama. So how should we understand these developments? Is mass culture infiltrating and displacing, destroying these local folk cultures, these, these characters kind of cutting in and interspersing and, and, and maybe uh, undermining the drama? Or are these concerns overstated? I'm a social scientist, and so I look at the. Uh, so what I do is what I, I look at what's actually happening in the drama to try to answer this question. And how how does the drama work within the community? Um, this is a very specific, precise, empirical way to look at or engage with this big question in my field: media study or international communication. How do we understand cultural globalization? How does it affect customs and values in local communities? Um, does it matter that it's a relatively poor, rural, undersourced community as well, where I did some of my work? in my studies. Um, so uh, before getting into kind of the heart of the Marin inter interpretation of the drama, I just want to very quickly go through a little bit of the scholarship uh, in this and what the debates and discussions are, and then we'll move into the drama itself. 
Um, so the critical view, the pessimistic view that these, that these forms of cultural globalization are undermining a lot of uh, local folkways and practices, uh, specific in relation to the dramas and folklore in, in Mexico, have been, for example, presented by people such as Nestor Garcia Canclini in books such as Transforming Modernity, uh, more precisely to the uh, dramas, the dances, the masquerades, people like Victor Jose Moya Rubi and Mascaras, La Otra Cara de Mexico, the of masks, the other face of Mexico. And so I want to just give you a sense of some of this critical scholarship. I will uh, give you just a, a little bit of that. So for example, Nestor Garcia Canclini writes, the globalization of culture imposes an unequal exchange of material and symbolic goods. Even the most remote ethnic groups are forced to subordinate their economic and cultural organization to national markets. What is the fate of traditional beliefs that give rise to fiestas? The secularization and commercialization of ceremonies is in reverse proportion to the extent to which a community is well integrated and has successfully has succeeded in satisfying its basic needs. And those needs would not only be material, but moral, uh, spiritual, religious needs as well that he would be implying. So this is really kind of undermining precisely the ability of communities to, to uh, sustain themselves in, in all kinds of ways, spiritual included. Uh, Moya, more specifically in relation to the masks and the dances in places like Michoacan writes, masks are now being made which do not correspond in all their details with traditional characters known within the ritual ceremonies or dances. This is due in large part to the fact that the mask makers are coming out of their traditional isolation because of the new communication media such as radio, television, newspapers, and books which put them in touch with different ideas and changing appearances. One notes too the deterioration of the quality of the mask. So a very uh, critical, skeptical, pessimistic work on effect of cultural globalization in a lot of the local communities. I want to actually give a more hopeful view, a counterpoint to this. This is Nestor Garcia Canclini 2.0. Um, he, he was uh, against it before he became for uh, aspects of cultural globalization. But in, in, uh, in scholarship, we sometimes think that's actually the mark of a seasoned, mature scholar. You look at evidence, something else happens, and you change your mind based on the best evidence. So a couple of years later, he writes something in a, in a very different key, partly moving past uh, what he had previously wrote. And so he writes in hybrid cultures, uh, today the intense and persistent relationship between the communities of artisans, and he's very much writing about Mexico here, and, and Michoacan in fact, and national and international culture make it normal for their members to be linked with modern visual culture. Thanks to their concern for certain traditions, the renewal of their artisanal trade, and the readjustment to a complex interaction with modernity, they have achieved a flourishing independence that would not have obtained by enclosing themselves in their ancestral traditions. Knowledge of culture and of popular would be advanced more if the sanitary preoccupation with distinguishing the pure and the contaminated in arts and crafts were abandoned, and if we were to study them starting with the uncertainties that provoke their crossing. So very much a very different view, a very different take, a much more hopeful take on cultural globalization and its uh, impact on local customs, morality, sustainability of crafts in the community. Um, to cut to the chase a little bit here, from everything that I saw during two years of ethnographic fieldwork was much closer in line with that second view, Garcia, Garcia Canclini 2.0. That was one of the questions I came down to try to look at in very empirical ways as an ethnographer to try to kind of sort through some of these debates in a local context. Um, so. Uh, the artisans whom I came to know in Tokoro and elsewhere really adroitly handled pop culture in the marketplace. The artisans and the customs are not undermined by pop culture or the marketplace uh, per se from everything that I saw in document. I'll take you a little bit through that, and I think we need to go through the dramas and place some of the characters, uh, some, some of these contemporary characters, right, and, and understand their place in, in the ritual, in the performance, in the drama, to try to understand what, what is going on here. So again, I want to briefly go into the pastorella. So the pastorellas of the shepherd's tale, these images that we have here, is from a town called Tokoro, about five, 600 people, the principal site for my field work. This is from a fi the Fiesta stage every year during Candelaria or Candle Mass, February 2nd through February 5th, um, and this was in the year 2006. Uh, the shepherd's journey again to the mangers to adore the baby Jesus in Bethlehem is also the allegory of every man's journey to faith. And they encounter temptations, distractors, uh, distractions, tricksters uh, foisted by the devil. So the artisans in Tokor and elsewhere that create masks of figures uh, uh, such as these um, they, they, they incorporate uh, popular culture and, and these become the trickster elements in the dramas. Does anybody have a sense of who that individual is? Who that might be? 
That would have been, and, and this in, in Mexico would have been very clearly known, that would have clearly been the image of the then president, Vicente Fox. So he's a trickster. He's this ineffective and clownish and threatening Cape Crusader as well. So they're poking fun in political ways at, uh, at uh, politicians and politics and all this political commentary from a moral perspective is happening in the drama here. Um, and uh, so, so these uh, figures such as Presidente Fox and I showed you earlier, uh, Superman, figures from media and national culture are impressed into customary roles in the pastorellas as these tricksters, these wa wavered souls or minions of the devil. Uh, so in jesting pop culture, the generic structure or the content is then maintained for the pastorella through practice and performance. This is a very important point. And so these tricksters, like all tricksters in the drama, seek to harass, distract, and seduce the shepherds who are on their way to the manger. President Fox, the Cape Crusader, is the buffoon or trickster who offers false promises and dis distracts the shepherds uh, or every man with false hopes. Uh, and this is also a time of real skepticism and let, let down or after a lot of uh, uh, enthusiasm and excitement about uh, uh, President Fox and, and uh, w how things were going to work and move on in, in Mexico and the politics. So that's also kind of an important context here. So uh, if, for, and from a scholarly standpoint, from uh, the context of communication or performance scholars, we could talk about elements of recontextualization, polyvocality, hybridity, uh, the carnivalesque here. Uh, um, and uh, so you have this, uh, this traditional customary religious story being told, um, but uh, it also becomes a context for political and social commentary precisely from a, a popular religious standpoint. What's actually going on, if we understand, we can interpret appropriately what's going on. And, and this is not just looking at the visual culture, but having very in-depth conversations with the folks who are the performers, the people creating the masks. If you ask them, they, you know, they explain. They tell you what's going on, what they believe is happening in the, in the drama, too. And obviously, part of it then becomes also just looking at it and imagining and uh, interpreting the creative element, the things that aren't said, but are there said through creative form, right? Um, so it's this flexibility, in fact, in the performance of the pastorellas, the shepherd's play, that makes this, the pastorella durable and relevant to the community and makes it part of living culture. Uh, and I just want to show you a couple of other uh, clips here. And this is, again, you have the contemporary characters and, and uh, the uh, more... Uh, 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 the, the more canonical traditional figures kind of in, the interspersed. These are the devils at the feet of the Archangel Michael. They try to uh, uh, really uh, harm and harass the shepherds. They've been defeated by the, Ar uh, by the Archangel Michael. And to, to their side in purple is a figure of the church. Kind of, you know, symbolically uh, at the side of the Archangel kind of pr protecting the shepherds from, from the demons, the devils. Um, does anybody have a sense who these two characters might be over there? These are two tricksters that were very much the ritual clowns or tricksters in the drama in this case. One again is Vicente Fox, the president of Mexico. The other one would be George, w, George Bush, George W. Bush. This is 2006 again. Uh, so he was the president. And they're sort of ambling through the crowd as the, as the drama spectacle is happening, intermingling partly with the characters and breaking out and, and, talk, uh, and walking along uh, where the audience members are in a very kind of aloof way. And so they are also the minions of the devil here. They are also tricksters uh, in this case. And, uh, you know, so, so th this is the, the way that really interesting and profound uh, uh, political, social, and religious commentary is being uh, presented all at once in the context of the community. Um, you know, and, and you know, th this is, again, a relatively marginalized community uh, where, where these dramas are happening. They really often can't get their voice out into the public sphere through the mass media. The mass media doesn't really look too much at what they're doing. These very elite politicians aren't going to be walking through these communities interacting with locals. So these uh, elite figures who would never mingle with the communities are really re literally brought into and dressed down within the cultural, symbolic, religious, ritual space of the community in the context of this religious drama. Uh, so we can think about all the inversions, all, all the political and social critique that's going on, very much in, in part through the expression of faith as well. Uh, you know, pretty powerful stuff. Uh, another example of, of, of a ritual clown here. Uh, this is uh, uh, a figure, one of the tricks is this is supposed to be a cameraman. 
Um, so again, the, the idea here is the media is the trickster in the sense that I mentioned in relation to the last slide. Uh, and it's important to pay attention to this message, this admonition, and to try to think and understand what it, what it means. For, coming from a community that doesn't really have good access to the media, to journalism, whose issues and concerns are not really represented too much in, in the public sphere, in, in, in the national or even the state media, in, in the state capital, and, 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 and all those sorts of places. Um, so a couple of things I'll be wrapping up here. Uh, first of all, uh, at least in many contexts, cultural dynamism, what I've been kind of showing here, is really a mundane and routine. It's not an apocalyptic or extraordinary thing. It's part of life here. It's part of life in Mexico. It's part of life everywhere. And it's something we just need to understand and, 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 and appreciate. Uh, the artisans and the folk practices are not undermined by pop culture or by, by the marketplace activity per se. I would change the argument and say that it's, it, what undermines them is precisely partly this discourse or claim that they are losing their authenticity. They're being corrupted by cultural globalization. Uh, in, in what sense do I mean that? These pastorellas, these shepherd's tale, exist as contexts, among other things, in which marginal groups can express social and political views and judgments, and clearly the ways I've shown in the context of, of a moral, religious, uh, spiritual framework as well. So in dismissing the practices in, in effect as being corrupt or inauthentic, often elite and metropolitan actors dismiss again the cultural and political voices of communities that are already marginalized. Um, and, and this is kind of an important point. Uh, so the critical view of or, uh, globalization echoed in Garcia Conclini 1.0, Moya. In this case, and I'm not saying this is uh, done intentionally you know, by, the, by, by, by these scholars, uh, other uh, in, individuals, cultural critics, really plays into and buttresses old established metropolitan patterns of cultural dismissal and disdain that exist in the United States, exist in the museum and heritage world, certainly exist in, in metropolitan elite culture in Mexico as well. Um, and, and, and precisely those types of practices themselves kind of reproduce and justify already the marginality and vulnerability of certain groups that really don't have a good chance to get their voice across. So I'll stop. So, so I will make one more point kind of from a theoretical standpoint and then take one more sort of uh, gloss on it, and then I'll open things up to, any, to a conversation questions folks might have. So the research in international communication, uh, which talks about uh, media and its role in social change, and that's an important question, but it in part needs to be shifted more than it has been uh, to the examination of cultural politics and the social relations in which claims such as corruption, displacement, and authenticity about media and social change are embedded. That's precisely what I've been, and I've been trying to show how and why that matters, how that, what that type of uh, critique examination might look like. And the questions there to ask from a very practical standpoint is whose voice, whose values are respected, are heard, whose are dismissed, ignored by elite academic metropolitan perspectives, uh, such as some of the ones that, that I uh, showed and what, what does it look like? What happens when you, when you uh, engage and try to understand those uh, values and what they're trying to say on their own terms, placing them into a social and moral context? Um, that's where I'm going to wrap up uh, the, the presentation. I really appreciate your, your coming here, engaging with this topic. I'll be very glad to take some questions or comments. And again, thank you very much. It's a delight to be here with you. Yes. Yes. Who decides what the characters, who they're actually right. going to be? Right. Is it a political group? Is it an organization? Or is it just individuals that decide they're going to make these maps? It's very individual. Uh, people, just a conversation happens, and, uh, and there's a lot, always a lot of excitement and drama. Who are the characters that are going to come out each year? They're going to be different. I mean, you're going to have the devils. You're going to have the shepherds. I mean, there's certain characters that are going to come, have to come out every year, and they do. Because they're, they're central characters in the drama. But a lot of who the tri tricksters, who the ritual clowns will be, that really varies. Uh, sometimes certain character has been very popular, so they might come out a, a, the, the, you know, two years in a row, or they be you know, out of the loop for a couple of years and then come back. And, and, and sometimes uh, you, you'll have these national figures from popular culture, from politics, but also sometimes you know, their commentary about the neighbors. And you know, so a lot of their like, inside jokes, a lot of lo you know, local gossip also gets sort of fleshed out in, in terms of who the characters are. So part of the drama is trying to figure out who is performing a certain character and also who this character is supposed to be. Yes? It doesn't quite relate, but what happens to the Mexican people that come here and have these, you know, craft, right. talent, right. 
Great question. Well, there are places. Uh, this is sort of uh, wasn't kind of the central focus of my work because I was uh, most of my research was in Mexico itself. But but there are certainly uh, folks and places where some of these. Uh, um, artists also do some of the carving, and, and if you have a large enough community, they will do some of the dramas. Often, people from particular community will often settle in, in, in a particular location. It could be in the state of Washington, it could be in California, Texas, other, other places, and they will try to recreate, with, with some changes, of course, some of the local customs. Uh, one of the things I always mention is that there's, you know, that there's a lot of pe people do really meticulous work with carving and things like that and in terms of the ability to do things like rest you know how many of them actually wind up in things such as restoration or 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 sculpting and things like that you know kind of fine craft work probably not too many but um uh, and it's one of those skills and practices very much you know lose it or use it or lose it and and so it, you know and if you aren't practicing it uh you may lose it uh, so there, there's a question about what happens in the context of immigration, how many of these skills are maintained. But certainly within the communities themselves in Mexico, from everything that I could see, there's no risk at all that these, that these customs are going to be lost. Other questions, comments, thoughts, reactions? Have folks uh, um, ever, has anybody been to maybe Mexico or has lo seen some of these uh, dances or practices? Has, was this completely brand new to, to folks here? Okay, uh, interesting for me to know. Um, and uh, every once in a while there, um, I, I, before I did my uh, postdoc uh, at the University of New Mexico, so there was uh, various ways you would have some of the artists from the border, Central Mexico would come up even to, to the university. Um, so, uh, and I still have very close connections and ties to uh, some of the artists, performers that do some of these dramas. So this is something just to consider down the road, but you know, if there was a way to bring some of these individuals to show some of this cultural performance and practice within the community, that would, I think, be of an interesting cultural social encounter and and uh, possibility think some really productive interesting dialogue given some of the interests here at Gonzaga and you know in, and uh, and in the community and, and some of the these cultural practices and kind of way they kind of work with values and things like that and concept globalization so um, one of my kind of long-term <laughs> projects maybe to think about um, well, I'll be wrapping up here unless there's any other uh, questions or thoughts anybody would have. I really appreciate you coming and, and kind of engaging in, uh, on this material with me. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to share.